بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Uh, tonight we'll be going over just a few uh, a few points in relation to the general topic of Ramadan preparation, and we continue to ask Allah even though we're in the uh, the last few days before Ramadan, we should continuously ask Allah. Anyways, Allahumma balighna Ramadan, right? To continuously ask Allah to help us to reach Ramadan because you're not there until you're there. Uh, and we hope to make it there and to capitalize on it as best we can to take advantage of the incredible opportunity uh, of Ramadan to harvest as many good deeds as we possibly can. We ask Allah to make that easy for all of us and we ask Allah to accept our efforts and to overlook uh, our shortcomings and our mistakes. And we ask Allah to help us to try our best and we hope for the best in that regard, inshallah. Uh, I want to go over the, uh, the few ayahs that we have in uh, Surah Al-Baqarah that directly relate to uh, the month of Ramadan. <clears throat> Excuse me, Allah begins this passage, uh, this constellation of incredible ayat. Uh, Allah begins this beautiful cluster of verses by saying, Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu, O you who believe. And Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhuma, it's not only that he was a, uh, a first cousin of the Prophet والسلام, but more so coupled with that, the fact that he grew up to become uh, an extremely important scholar from among the generation of the companions from the Sahaba. And given that incredible uh, background of his, he said, when you come across an ayah, a verse in the Quran, that begins with Ya ladina amanu o you who believe to pay extra attention because Allah is either going to tell us to do something that's good for us or to avoid something that's harmful for us. So what he's teaching us is that there's an extra layer of importance. So you have the Quran in general, and then there's an extra layer of importance on top of that when it comes to these verses specifically that begin with Ya ladina amanu, that begin with O you who believe. So Allah begins. This passage with, O you who believe, Ya ladina amanu. And then Allah says, Kutiba alaykum siyam. Fasting has been prescribed upon you, just like it was prescribed upon those who came before you, so that you may attain taqwa, so that you may uh, attain piety, so you may become more God conscious, so that you can become a better person and a better Muslim. Now, this is an extremely important point. The Prophet, he taught us, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he pointed to his chest, to his heart, his blessed heart three times. And he said, taqwa is here. Piety is here, indicating, uh, pointing to his chest, to his heart. What he's teaching us is something extremely important. The foundation of taqwa is in your heart. It's something internal. The roots of taqwa are in the heart. Some people may get it twisted. Some people may flip it and they may think, that the roots of taqwa are in your external being. Now, external things, do they have their time and their place in our deen? Yes, absolutely, there's no question about it. But the inside comes before the outside. The inside is the priority, right? That is step one. And then the external uh, different things are, are secondary. They have their time and their place. Nonetheless, they're still secondary and not necessarily primary. Some people flip it. Some people, they only want to focus on the outside, but then they completely neglect themselves internally, right? So these are people, they may practice Islam outwardly, but then they have the worst of character. We ask Allah to protect us from that, right? So what we want to do is to have balance and to recognize, right, the internal is the priority. That is step number one. When you look at the, the, the verses, the surahs revealed in Mecca, the focus is what? Foundational knowledge. Right? Belief in one God, belief in the day of judgment, and preparing for that day, worshiping one God, God alone, and to understand that it makes a whole lot more sense to believe in la ilaha illallah as opposed to otherwise. Right, So these, these were the foundational concepts that, that were, this was the foundation that was laid in Mecca. And then if you notice, the majority of the ahkam, of the, the different rulings, the different things that relate to halal and haram, they're in Medina. Right, typically speaking, why? Because by the time they were in Medina, one, their survival was much more secure as opposed to Mecca, where you had, especially 
you know, after some time, you had torture, you had murder, etc., just because they were Muslim. They were being persecuted just because they believed in La ilaha illallah. But then when they ended up in Medina, and then they could practice freely, then they could breathe, then they could relax a little bit, right, relatively speaking, then you have the, 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 the relevance, then you have the time and the place for different things to be built on top of that foundation. So the Prophet is teaching us, alayhi salatu wasalam, that taqwa is here, is in the heart. Allah says, fasting has been prescribed upon you, just like those who came before you. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Right, so what should we do? Look internally, to look at the heart and to ask ourselves, are we becoming better people because of our fasting? Are we becoming better Muslims because of our fasting? Or are we becoming worse people? Are we using fasting as a sour excuse to treat people with horrible character, right? As if it's justifiable to snap at anyone and everyone because I'm fasting, that makes it okay. SubhanAllah, <laughs> right? What happened to the importance of polishing the heart? No one is saying it's easy. It's very difficult. Heart work is hard work. But Allah is telling us, try your best to put in that work and I'll help you along the way. Walk towards Allah, Allah will run towards you. It may seem like this, this really difficult idea to, to work on the heart, to actually look internally, as opposed to focusing on everyone else and their faults. Pause. That's easy. What's hard? To look within your own heart, to look within yourself, and then to work on that. That's a whole lot more challenging. That's also why a lot of people, right, they don't want to do that. They only want to look at the, the external, uh, you know, appearances or whatever, different things related to other people. And then they completely overlook the, the, the major, you know, gaps and cracks in their own heart, right? Something has to change. And we ask Allah to help us to make those positive changes as best we can. We ask Allah to increase all of us in taqwa and ya rabbil alameen. In the second ayah, in this beautiful uh, constellation of verses, Allah refer. this is so beautiful. Allah refers to the days of fasting of Ramadan as a limited number of days. Now what's the what's the feeling here? The feeling here is that Allah is encouraging us because Allah Allah knows how we are. Allah knows that when we look at the month of Ramadan, the fasting of Ramadan, naturally naturally we typically feel intimidated. And we feel like, man, this is overwhelming. This looks like this really steep climb. I don't know if I can do it. Allah is encouraging us. Allah is giving us that that nudge of loving kindness and encouragement. It's a few days. Regarding the fasting, Allah says it's a few days. Right? So Allah is encouraging us that just take it one day at a time. Right? When you start, when you start your fasting in the morning, just focus on making it until evening. Start there. Just focus on that one day at a time. And then do that each day. And then before you know it, the month is gonna is gonna uh, come and go. And you're gonna complete those days as best you can, inshallah. May Allah accept everyone's efforts. And you know, you'll make it through it before you know it. This is the feeling here, right? The, this is the vibe of, of, uh, of this ayah. It's just a few days, a limited number of days. And then in the ayah after that, and this is really beautiful, Allah mentions regarding the Qur'an, Allah says the month of Ramadan is when he sent down the Qur'an. Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. So you notice something. When it comes to fasting, Allah says a few days. But then when it comes to the Qur'an, Allah says the month of Ramadan, right? A much grander uh, term, right? Allah didn't say the month of Ramadan is when you have to fast. And then for the Qur'an, it's a few days. No, no, no. Allah switched it. For fasting, it's a few days. But then for Qur'an, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ The month of Ramadan is when the Prophet first uh, received revelation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, so this is when the Prophet first received revelation. So because of that, the entire month of fasting was given to us because of the Quran. The, we have the month of Ramadan because of the Quran. And even if you look at the, uh, the order of what's mentioned within this ayah, this specific ayah. Allah mentions the month of Ramadan is when the Qur'an was revealed. So Allah mentions the Qur'an first. And then afterwards, eventually, Allah gets to 
fasting. فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصوم. And whoever witnesses this uh, this great month, then let them fast. But first, Allah emphasized the uh, the the Quran. Notice something. Out of six thousand two hundred thirty-six verses in the Quran, this is the only one in which Allah mentions the month of Ramadan by name. So that there's something special here, right? Allah wants us to to take a second look, to do a double take when it comes to this ayah, right? To read it once and to read it twice, j just for the sake of reflection, right? Why is this the only ayah in which Allah mentions the month of Ramadan by name? What can I take away from this absolute gem of an ayah? How can I take something from this and become a better person because of it? How can I take something from this verse, from this ayah and become a better Muslim because of it, become a better mu'min because of it, to, to strive for ihsan, maybe to come closer to becoming uh, uh, a, a, a muhsin because of it, right? So the idea is we wanna, we wanna extract nectar from these beautiful ayat in the Quran. So Allah is saying here, the month of Ramadan is when the Quran was sent down. So what, what's a beautiful, uh, important uh, point we can take from this to really focus on the Quran as best we can. Unfortunately for some people, right, they care more about their iftar than they do the Quran. Now, is it a huge blessing to have access to different options and different fresh ingredients and amazing, you know, spices and, and this cuisine and that cuisine? Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah for his blessings. But the idea is moderation, is moderation. No one is saying to not have a good iftar, have a good iftar, a well-balanced iftar, where you not only have, you know, the, the, the protein and and, and you know, maybe something sweet after. It's not just about the rice and chicken and then afterwards the gulab jamun or the kunafa or whatever it is, right? To have some fruits, to have some vegetables, to make sure to hydrate, right? To, to maybe get some electrolytes into our system, right? To eat some watermelon, to have some cucumbers, to, to, to figure that out so we can have uh, well-balanced meals. The point that I'm trying to make though is to avoid falling into the trap of wanting to have the fanciest iftar in the world every single night. SubhanAllah. Like it's just you and your family and you want to have like 12 different fancy dishes on the table. You know, you want to have at the same, at, at the same iftar, right? With like five people there, right? You want there to, to be shrimp and beef and chicken and turkey. MashaAllah, not just Thanksgiving, but even now, right? Uh, give thanks in Ramadan and then to also have this other option and this one subhanAllah this, this is and it's for like five people this is too much right and then there ends up being so much time spent on having like these super extra elaborate iftars to the point that there's no time for Quran right so why not have rice and chicken and then you have some salad you have some lentil soup you have some water you have some tea whatever, whatever floats your boat you do your thing mashallah but then you kind of keep it to that where it's still good. It's still a legit iftar. It's not too much though. So by having that legit iftar, there, there is time spent on it. Alhamdulillah, it's a blessing. But it's not too much time to the point that there's no time left for Quran. Have that good iftar, prepare that good iftar for everyone to enjoy that good iftar. MashaAllah, you have the right niyyah, there's reward for that. Beautiful, MashaAllah. But what about Quran? What about Quran? And when I say this, it's not necessarily about the quantity, although yes, that does have its time in its place, but it's not just about the information, it's also about the transformation. Someone may go through the entire Quran, they read all of the quote unquote information of the Quran, but then nothing transforms whatsoever. They go through it because it's routine, it's a process, A to Z, start again, and that's it for them in, in, in this example. So they read the whole Quran, but was there any transformation because of it? Did you give extra charity because of it? Were you extra kind because of it? Did you complain less when going to your local masjid because of it? This is a big one. Oftentimes, unfortunately, when it comes to Ramadan, you have some people, they actually up the ante when it comes to complaining more as if Allah did not tell us at the end of this ayah to become grateful. One of the purposes of Ramadan is to become grateful, to become a more grateful person. 
So if, if we're reading it and we know this ayah, we memorize it, mashallah, wonderful. Are we actually becoming more grateful because of spending time with the Quran? And this is the type of topic, the type of thing that a lot of people don't want to reflect about, unfortunately, and that's the sad reality. They think to themselves that, hey, I'm going to read this much. Don't get me wrong. Do your thing. MashaAllah, that's good. If it's coupled with positive transformation, right? Are you becoming a better human being because of it? Are you becoming a better Muslim because of it? Right? Some people think that, MashaAllah, Ramadan comes, I'm going to become a much better Muslim. I'm going to like read more Quran. I'm going to do all this fasting and I'm going to pray extra. But then in terms of being a human being, I'm going to become worse. I'm going to become mad at everyone. I'm going to become haram police with everyone. I'm going to be rude to everyone and be cranky with everyone. And I'm going to criticize everyone. And I'm going to be ungrateful for everything. So in their mind, they became a better Muslim. But then in reality, they became a worse human being. That doesn't make sense. That's an oxymoron. Right? That, 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 that's not what's supposed to happen. What's supposed to happen is nurun ala nur. The light of the fitra, coupled with and beautified by the light of revelation. That's what's supposed to happen, right? A person tries to become a better human being, and they also try to become a better Muslim. MashaAllah, right? And this is what we ask Allah for. Within this ayah, Allah mentions uh, Shah Ramadan, this, uh, this one ayah that mentions Ramadan by name. Allah, uh, Allah mentions the month of Ramadan is when the, the Quran was sent down when the Prophet initially received revelation and then at the end of uh, Allah mentions fasting and a few other uh, beautiful things at the end of the ayah Allah recaps the ayah by mentioning three things to complete the number of days uh, of, of fasting I guess you could explain this as and so you may like magnify or glorify Allah uh, because of what he guided you to, uh, out of uh, appreciation for the guidance that Allah gave you, recognizing that if you became a better person and a better Muslim in the month of Ramadan, if you managed to quit this addiction or that addiction during the month of Ramadan, if you managed to quit hanging out with bad friends during the month of Ramadan, and if you managed to go to the masjid on somewhat of a consistent basis, whatever works for you, if possible, obviously there's COVID, you have a thousand things going on, but the idea is if there's any type of increase in good and decrease in bad to understand and to recognize that that guidance in reality goes back to Allah. So to, 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 to do takbir because of that, to, to magnify Allah um, and to, to, to glorify God because of that. Completing the number of days, uh, appreciating uh, God's guidance and تشكرون, and so you may become grateful. One explanation of this is completing the number of days relates to the month of Ramadan. And then this can uh, relate to the, the takbirat, te the extra Allahu Akbars on Eid. Uh, this can refer to uh, the day of Eid al Fitr. وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ can refer to the six days uh, from Shawwal. Allah knows best, right? The idea is this, this month is, it's, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not simply ritual. What it's supposed to be is ritual coupled with spiritual. And then that's where you have the metamorphosis occurring within the heart of the person. Right? Going back to the heart, going back to the roots of La ilaha illallah, first and foremost, primarily being in the heart of the person. Right? So we should become more pious, we should also become more grateful. So Allah is reminding us to try our best to complete the days, to try our best to do some you know, extra takbirat on the day of Eid. And then if possible, you know, you have the, the six days from uh, Shawal, I noticed that's connected with, with gratitude, right? If you manage to, let's say someone manages to fast, you know, most of the month of Ramadan, they miss a, a, a few days, maybe they miss a week because they're sick, because of one thing or another, but they're really doing their best to, to do what they can, right? To recognize that, man, you know, that happened 
because Allah helped me to, to, to do my best. Alhamdulillah. So out of gratitude, out of appreciation, because I know, for example, if I was left to myself and my own devices and I did not have divine support, if I did not have help from God, I don't know if I could have, could have even made it through a single day. Right? But if a person makes it through day one and two and three and 13, 14, 15, for example, and then Eid comes and it's like, man, you know, gratitude for how much Allah helped me to really try to take advantage of this incredible opportunity of Ramadan. Uh, one, one explanation of this, and Allah knows best, is uh, in relation to fasting the six days from Shawwal. And what's beautiful, this, subhanAllah, this is the, the beauty of the, the, the vastness, the richness, and the incredible nuance of the, the, the beautiful mosaic of, an, of, of our Islamic tradition. You have, you have two explanations of fasting six days from Shawwal. One explanation, uh, and this, uh, this was the opinion of Imam al-Shafri, may, may Allah have mercy on him. His explanation was fasting six days from Shawwal meant six days from Shawwal. So it, these six days have to be within the month of Shawwal, right? Six days from Shawwal. So it's, it's, it's a part of the whole of, of Shawwal. So between the first and last day of Shawwal to fast six days. Imam Malik's understanding, may Allah have mercy on him, was six days from Shawwal. It's the same exact hadith. But this, again, this is the richness and how broad the beauty is in our tradition, subhanAllah. Imam Malik's opinion was six days from Shawwal means six days from Shawwal, meaning starting from Shawwal, and you have until basically the next Ramadan. So you have from the month after Ramadan until uh, until Sha'ban, basically, you have this like 11 month window to, to chip away at those six days. Alhamdulillah. And even the math makes sense both ways because the Prophet taught us والسلام, that whoever fasts the month of Ramadan, right? And then you follow it with six days from Shawwal, then the, the reward uh, is like they fasted the whole year. The reward is like they, they fasted uh, a lifetime. Now, what's the explanation of this? Fasting the month of Ramadan you're fasting how many months? One. Now, if you do a good deed, it's multiplied by 10. The minimum is 10, right? So the simple math is if you fast one month, then with Allah, it's as if you fasted 10 months. And then if you fast six days, you multiply it by 10, 60 days. What is that when you break it down? Two months. So you add fasting Ramadan plus six days basically 36 days you multiply it by 10 360 days basically uh, a year right so even the math makes perfect sense when you take both opinions imam shafi's opinion or uh, imam malik's opinion right what we need to do is we need to expand the the the, the boundaries of our understanding because oftentimes what happens is what a person grew up with one of these beautiful opinions and they love that beautiful opinion. That's what they did and their family and their friends. And that's the culture where they grew up in. That's what was done. The community they grew up in. That's what was done. MashaAllah. Tabarakallah. But then if they find someone with a different, perfectly valid and beautiful opinion. Right. Unfortunately, sometimes people, they want to go and, 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 and give them a hard time and bash on them. And SubhanAllah. Right? Take a step back. Calm down. Right. Be kind to people. Start there. Just be a good human being. Start there. And then before you go and correct someone regarding following a different, perfectly valid and acceptable and beautiful opinion, right? Look into it a little bit more and then look into it a little bit more and then repeat that process like 10 different times and then like another 10 times and then think about it 10 times. Let it marinate for like a year or two and then revisit just the idea of maybe you're not, you should go and correct that person for doing something else that's totally valid. Hopefully by that point, the understanding is there that, oh, so what that person was doing, okay, now I see where they're coming from. Alhamdulillah. Right, we ask Allah to guide us and forgive us and to help us to make things easy for us. Amin Rabbil Alameen. And the ayah after this, so you have the ayah that begins with, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, kutiba alaykum usiyam. Ayyama ma'adudat. Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. So far, there is a very clear pattern. Each and every one of these three verses directly um, tie in with the month of Ramadan, right? All of 
verse one in in uh, um, in in this uh, cluster has to do with fasting, and then the second ayah in this uh, section, fasting, and the next ayah, fasting, right? So you have Ramadan, Ramadan, Ramadan. Uh, fasting is mentioned uh, in uh, in each of them. Of course, you have the the month of Quran, uh, and in reality, we Subhanallah. There are some people in the community. Um, they may not be able to fast because they cannot fast and they have a chronic condition that does not allow them to fast at all now or in the future. But they still have a transformative Ramadan through the Quran, reading it, listening to it, learning it, understanding it, reflecting on it, applying it. They have a beautifully transformative Ramadan. Even, even though they can't fast because they have some sort of serious health condition, for example, but they still have a fruitful Ramadan, a positively transformative Ramadan. But then on the other hand, sometimes you have people who can fast and they do fast and they fast every day in Ramadan and they pray at night. But in this case, they may not, in this example, they may not necessarily have a fruitful Ramadan. So benefiting from Ramadan, having a fruitful Ramadan, having a transformative Ramadan, oftentimes is linked to the fasting, but it's not necessarily linked to the fasting. You can still become a better person, a better Muslim, even if you can't necessarily fast due to health conditions. And we ask Allah to make things easy for everyone. The Prophet warned us that there are some people, they, 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 they fast during the, day of Ramadan, during the days of Ramadan, but the only thing they get out of it, hunger and thirst. And there are people, they pray at night, consistently during the month of Ramadan, but they don't get anything out of it other than exhaustion and fatigue. The Prophet is teaching us if you're only doing these things physically and externally, and your heart is not present, and you're not mindful, then you're not going to get anything out of it. The Prophet is teaching us there has to be a balance between the internal and the external. The fasting is good, it should be transformative. The praying is good, it should be transformative. Right? We ask Allah to make things easy for all of us. After these three ayat, uh, then Allah dedicates an entire ayat to dua. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Subhanallah. We ask Allah to accept our duas and we ask Allah for, for the best responses. And Allah knows best in relation to our duas. We may ask Allah for A, but Allah knows that A is bad for us. And Allah gives us B or C or D. We ask Allah to make us content with whatever He decides in, in response to uh, our supplications, our duas. Allah's promise is that he'll respond But he didn't say how he'll respond Allah responds how he chooses When he chooses Where, when, etc We make dua But part of the dua is also Handing over the affair to Allah We ask Allah to receive But after asking We basically hand it over to Allah To, to decide whatever is best for us. And it's happened many a time for all of us. We ask Allah for one thing. It doesn't happen. And it's bitter. Allah gives us something different. Allah removes something harmful from our path, whatever it is. And then years later, oftentimes we look back and we see the wisdom behind Allah preventing A from us or preventing us from A, for example. Right? Allah knows best. We ask Allah to make it easy for us and we ask Allah to grant all of us wisdom. In this ayah, look at the beginning of it. Allah says to the Prophet والسلام, and when my servants ask you regarding me, I'm near. There's something missing, or it looks like there's something missing. And when this happens in the Quran, less is more. It, it's done beautifully strategically. In other places in the Quran, you find a, a certain pattern, right? Allah says um, elsewhere in Surah Al-Baqarah, and they ask you regarding uh, the, the, uh, the orphan. Right? They ask you regarding orphans. So, so there's a formula. They ask you regarding this. Say this. Uh, so on and so forth. They ask you regarding an issue, say, this is your response. You find that structure in several verses in the Quran. But you notice something here. Allah didn't say, 
And when my servants ask you about me, say, I am near. Allah did not even say, say, to, 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 to show his nearness. What does Allah say? And when my servants ask you about me, I'm near. I'm near. The ayah doesn't say, and when my servants ask you about me, say I'm near. Because Allah is showing us how near he is. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Allah, Allah is, uh, and when Allah says that he's near, right, oftentimes we may think that, that, that must be for the pious, that must be for those people way up there, that must be regarding them, because for me as someone who makes mistakes all the time, there's, there's no way this can apply to me, that's not true though, and we shouldn't think in that way in this regard. Allah knows that we make mistakes all the time. Even if we're trying our best, we still make mistakes. And then we try our best again and we still fall down. And then we get up and then we fall down. And then we, it's like a toddler, lear, toddler learning how to walk. So what Allah is doing here, Allah is encouraging us. And when you look at the rest of the ayah, the feeling is Allah is telling us, just call upon me once or twice, just do it. Right? Don't don't spend so much time, you know, ruminating on your mistakes and your past sins and and this and that and don't look at that. Instead, look down, look at your hands and ask Allah. Ask Allah. And if you're really that concerned, which we are, if you really are that concerned about your mistakes, then what do you do? What if there are these massive mistakes? And then what do you do? Is there still hope? The answer is yes. What do you do? Step one. Ask Allah for forgiveness. And then what? And then ask Allah for whatever you want. What did Prophet Suleiman teach us? Right? He teaches us this exact formula. First, he asked Allah for forgiveness. My Lord, forgive me. And then he asked Allah for an, uh, something huge, something amazing, so, something just, you know, grandiose. To an extreme, in a good way. He asked Allah for forgiveness, and then he asked Allah, not for something small. He asked Allah for something huge. And then he asked Allah for this amazing kingdom that is so amazing and incredible, such that, and is so amazing such that not a single person after him will ever have uh, a similar kingdom. What, 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 how did Allah respond? Allah answered his dua, and Allah gave him, and gave him, and gave him, and gave him. And Allah relieved all the pressure. Here's a blank check. Go do whatever you want. Now, obviously, Prophet Suleiman, he, he's a king and a nebi. He's a, he's, a, he's a king and a prophet. So, of course, he used his kingdom in, in many awesome ways that were very good for the sake of Allah. Right? But the point is, ask Allah for forgiveness. There's the purification and then the beautification. And then ask Allah for whatever it is that you want. Ask Allah for forgiveness and then ask Allah to help you to go in the right direction. Ask Allah for forgiveness. Ask Allah for that job that you want. Ask Allah for forgiveness. Ask Allah for that raise that you want. Ask Allah for forgiveness. Ask Allah for that spouse that you want. Ask Allah for forgiveness. Then ask Allah for whatever it is that you want. You fill in the blanks. And Allah is the one saying, call upon me and I'll give. Call upon me and I'll respond to you. So if Allah himself is saying this, then how can you despair? We ask Allah to protect us from despair. I'll wrap up now. In the ayah after this, Allah goes back to the specific topic uh, of Ramadan. Uh, within this ayah, you have the, the, the beautiful phrase of what a, uh, uh, a healthy, sustainable, um, and uh, happy, uh, dynamic marriage looks like. <laughs> Allah tells the, uh, the, the husbands that your wives are like garments for you and you're like garments for them. Right? And there, there are so many layers of wisdom uh, layers, no pun intended. There's so many layers of wisdom behind the subhanAllah, right? And and you have many other things mentioned, different, you know, rulings related to uh, Ramadan extracted from this. The main the main point for all of this, for all of this, and all this is a reminder for me first and foremost, we want to try our best to become better people during the month of Ramadan, to beautify our character as best we can and also to become better Muslims, not only during the month of Ramadan, but we want to keep something going. We're not going to, so we have like before Ramadan, during Ramadan, 
what we want to avoid is going back down to the same exact point that we were in before Ramadan, after Ramadan. So there's before and then during, and then we want after to be somewhere in between. It may very well be closer to what it was before Ramadan, realistically speaking, but we want it to be a notch above. So if you can keep something going from what you were doing during the month of Ramadan, take like 10% of what you were doing extra in Ramadan, and then keep that going afterwards if you can. If you were giving, if you were giving a uh, hundred bucks every Friday in the month of Ramadan, and that was working for you, and you were just giving and giving for the sake of Allah, mashallah, may Allah accept it. And then you feel like afterwards, okay, that was Ramadan, there was that Ramadan high, what about now? That things are kind of, you know, slowing down uh, a little bit. Try to keep 10% going, you know, try to keep giving 10 bucks every Friday when you go for Jumu'ah after that. Something sustainable. We ask Allah to guide us and forgive us. We, we still ask Allah, Allahumma balaghna Ramadan, oh Allah, help us to reach Ramadan, help us to benefit from it as much as we possibly can. We ask Allah to make it a beautiful, fruitful experience for all of us. We ask Allah for the best of this life and the next and to protect us from his punishment. May Allah make us people of Qur'an. May Allah make us people of Qur'an. May Allah make us people of Qur'an. May Allah make the Qur'an the oasis of our hearts and the light of our chests. We ask Allah to make the Qur'an the spring of our hearts and the light of our chests. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah to accept our efforts and to overlook our mistakes, uh, past, present, and future. Rabbana taqabil minna innaka anta sami'l alim wa tab'a alayna innaka anta tabawil rahim. Subhana rabbika rabbil azzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. I hope and I pray that everyone is safe and healthy for you, your loved ones, your friends, and your family, inshaAllah. Ramadan mubarak to everyone. And we hope to see you soon. And we ask Allah, uh, we ask Allah for the best and we hope for the best uh, whatever that, uh, whatever that ends up meaning, we hope for the best. Inshallah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.